This game is basically the reason I started this series, both in the metaphorical sense and the literal one. I played a lot of fighting games when I was a kid, and I also rented a lot of games. At least every other weekend since about 1995 was filled with three days of me blissfully blasting through a new title. Whether that was a licensed platformer, an in-depth RPG, an ant simulator, or as it often was, a fighting game like Mace of the Dark Age. I'm Eric J. Chucky, and welcome to Violent Profiles, where we discuss obscure fighting games and the rosters that define them. You might be wondering why, if Mace is so important to me, I didn't make it more of a priority to cover. Why wasn't it the first episode of this season? Why wasn't it part of the initial series of videos I put out years ago? The short answer is incentive. I wanted to make good on the hype I built, reward the patience of longtime viewers, and actually put out a year's worth of content I could be proud of. If Mace was always looming on the horizon as a goalpost, I was more likely to get there. And here we are. I don't believe I ever owned the mace cart in my youth, though I do possess a copy today, but I probably spent enough money borrowing it back then that I should have just made the purchase. Atari and Midway's 1997 release lured me in with Nintendo Power previews featuring a scary headsman and a lava warlord. Despite the reviews that called it a Mortal Kombat ripoff that looks fantastic but plays poorly, damning it with the faint praise of being, ironically, one of the best fighters on the system to date in a pool of good fighting games available for the N64 that was quite shallow, this remains one of my all-time favorite fighters. A large part of that is the characters and ideas that have sprinkled themselves through my own works in time since, be they Dungeons & Dragons campaigns, E-Fed personalities, my Soul Calibur Create a Soul roster, or a little video series on the internet. Mace of the Dark Age is rad, and I'd like to tell you why. We open in the 14th century. Asia is at constant war beset by Batu Khan's Golden Horde. The Middle East is run by a shadow organization of assassins who set up and eliminate political pawns to maintain power. And Europe is ground under the thumb of a handful of despotic feudal lords. The biggest players among them all are the Covenant of Seven, who have thrown their lot in with Asmodeus, who is listed as a practitioner of the dark arts in the intro, but, I mean, that's clearly a friggin' demon. Look at him. Asmodeus wields the Mace of Tannis, an artifact imbued with necropotic energy that offers those who command it everlasting life and ultimate power at the price of forcing them to feed off of despair, disease, and poverty. That's fine with Asmodeus, he just shares a bit of the Mace's power with the Covenant of Seven in exchange for their continued tyranny, ensuring he'll be able to sustain his might. Of course, wicked hearts like the Seven are rarely content with what they're given, so each begins conspiring to take Asmodeus' magic beat stick for their own. They dispatch their mightiest warriors in pursuit of it, and some even aim to claim it by their own hands. We join the story shortly after this point, in the midst of a civilian uprising as diverse powers converge en route to the Mace itself. Let's begin with the big bad voodoo daddy, Lord Demos. The most prominent playable antagonist in the game, I commend Mace for slapping him on the box art. Most titles wouldn't put such a despicable character in the story solo on the cover until the Far Cry series made it cool in 2012. Unless you count Bubsy 3D. I could possibly go wrong. This Bavarian autocrat is a long-standing member of the Covenant of Seven, ruling from his mountaintop fortress overlooking a vast, tortured landscape known as the Great Wastelands. It's all very Volcano Manor, if I'm being honest. If he turned into a giant communism snake, I'd have some questions for FromSoft. Demos has persisted for hundreds of years, and wears armor forged by the devil himself. It's Demos and his agents responsible for riling up the rest of the Seven, hastening their infighting so that he may take advantage. His aims are to have Countess Taria by his side, Asmodeus' gruesome head on his wall, and the Mace of Tannis in his iron fist. If your efforts at battling the latter of opponents are unsuccessful, Demos returns to Bavaria to find not delicious conciliatory cream-filled donuts, but his fortress in the hands of the peasant populace whose lives he made a literal living hell. Weakened from the battle and just as susceptible to action economy as the rest of us, the peasants overtake him and nearly lash him in chains. Not wanting to take the L to a bunch of rabble, Demos breaks free long enough to hop into the lava moat surrounding his castle, cooking himself to ash inside his own armor. Toasty! But Demos is a seven-foot-tall fire wizard wielding a molten greatsword, so he's very likely to be successful against Asmodeus. In this scenario, he drinks the devil's blood and uses the mace to kill the remaining Covenant of Seven, adding their legions to his own and uniting Eurasia under his rule. The Second Dark Age lasts eternally, and no one can threaten the power of the malfeasant Lord Demos. Mace isn't all about the bad guys, though. Here's Mordos Call, the first guy you fight in arcade mode and owner of a bitchin' stage song. An Italian orphan raised by the Romani, Call's life takes a miserable turn one November when the people who gave him a home for his formative years are outlawed by one of the Seven and slaughtered wholesale. Call fought back, and his skill was noticed by the mercenaries who were sent to do the deed, along with the fact that he wasn't actually Romani himself. The mercs offered him a place in their company, and ever since, Mordo's Call's flail has been for sale to the highest bidder. He's a veteran of countless wars and the last surviving member of the outfit, with everyone else having met a tragic, accidental end. This impressive pedigree earned the eye of one of the Covenant of Seven, who has hired him to retrieve the Mace of Tannis. If Call swings and kicks his way to victory, he learns two important details from the Mace, the names of his greatest enemies. Sir Dragon was the member of the Seven who had his parents killed, and Lord Demos gave the order to annihilate his second Romani family. Mordo's Call resolves to infiltrate the ranks of the Seven, 
continue to earn their trust as a powerful mercenary and eventually destroys them from the inside. His honorable soul has turned the mace into a weapon of virtue, wielding it with wisdom and inspiring the masses for generations to come. Or, more likely, since the other dozen members of the roster defeat him in the first steps toward Asmodeus, Cole returns to Italy a shattered man. He intends to join the farmers and put his physique to good use, but with the soil tainted and ruined by the evil power of the mace, they cannot support him. Cole becomes a shell of his former self, begging for money and food as he staggers through the streets. Our next fighter is Al Rashid. Of the turbulent wind. No, not you. Get out of here. The son of Khalid, king of the assassins, Al Rashid was eager to impress his father and join the league. Tasked with eliminating the potentate of Damascus, Al Rashid went above and beyond not only by killing him, but his advisors and 14 personal bodyguards without making enough noise to wake the guard dogs. Damn, where's my stealth action Al Rashid game? Because of his exemplary success, Khalid gifted his son a pair of legendary scimitars forged with the power of the turbulent wind. Yes, that. This is what grants Al Rashid tornado magic in addition to his sick ass whirling dervish offense. Rashid is dispatched to retrieve the Mace of Tanis on contract from the Sultan of Chicagoland, but what possible hope could a simple assassin with magic wind swords have against a towering demon? Al Rashid is so thoroughly beaten that he loses his signature weapons. His father is understandably pissed off and tells him to get the swords back, but Al Rashid remembers having to fight an actual demon and tries to kill Khalid instead. Turns out the King of the Assassins is pretty good at hand-to-hand -hand combat and bests his son, imprisoning him in the tallest tower of his fortress to never again see the light of day. But, if Al Rashid were able to claim the mace for himself, he could use its power to kill his father with ease. He could, in fact, then become the King of the Assassins, usurp the Sultan of Shirak, and hypnotize Namira to become his personal concubine. His people would hate him and constantly make attempts on his life, but you can't out-assassinate the new King of the Assassins. I actually like the idea of him losing more, because in a theoretical non-existent sequel to the game, Al Rashid could have broken out from his prison, or be unleashed by Khalid and become this ravenous, frenzy-driven madman obsessively searching for his lost swords. Also, shout out to all my pedantic homies in the audience who are currently really pleased that a so-called assassin in a video game is actually primarily performing murders of prominent political figures. I mentioned Mira back there, so let's explore her story next. Now, Mira's birth name is Tulwara, and she's an Arabian princess whose family was murdered by Khalid and the Sultan of Shirak. Now, Mira's life was spared since she was smuggled out of the castle by one of her guards, but instead of being granted freedom or help to find justice for her family's assassination, she was instead sold into slavery for retirement money. Since, you know, that whole make sure the royal family doesn't get murked gig didn't quite work out for him. Namira ends up a dancing girl in a lesser sultan's harem. She has no memory of her childhood, but there are dreams that seem so real they might be memories of a palatial estate and a pampered life. She overhears servants talking about the missing Princess Talwara and begins to wonder. Either way, she's fed up with wiggling for perverts and learns swordplay from a court eunuch to kill the sultan. She questions him about her origins, but with his dying breath he spits only Asmodeus knows. Which is a baller way to say screw you to your murderer. Oh, you stabbed me through the heart and now you want to know about your secret origins? How about go ask the super devil? If that goes how the dying sultan planned, Namira is handed over to the Sultan of Shirak, member of the Covenant of Seven, and the guy who footed the bill for her family's execution. She's physically and psychologically abused, becoming delirious, and eventually trying to convince the castle rats of her royal birthright. Tragic. But her good ending leads me to question how honorable Namira's goals truly are. If she uses her fiery spirit and the little bit of magic she commands to defeat Asmodeus, she learns about all parties responsible for her family's murder and cuts her way through the ranks, going the extra mile to kill Khalid's son Al-Rashid and taking particular pleasure in it. Which, um, pretty sure we killed him on the way in, but, eh, you know what, never mind. Namira becomes the first Sultana, which, whether Atari knew this or not, is historically accurate, as the real-life first female Sultan Khadija wasn't until 1347. She reverses the gender roles and forces men to veil their faces and surrender their businesses, and the ripples of this are felt all the way into modern times, where her empire is known to produce some of the most powerful and skilled businesswomen and politicians. I actually really like this ending because it provides subtle commentary on the nature of revenge and how often characters driven by it can take things too far, even when their motives seem pure. Is Namira justified in killing the people responsible for ruining her life and reversing the restrictive rules against women? Sure. But in enforcing the same rules on men and killing Al-Rashid again, simply for the pleasure of it, just makes her a different kind of tyrant. But the game doesn't hold your hand to get to this point, or even go out of its way to say, see, she's just as bad. It lets you draw your own conclusions. It's more nuanced than you'd expect from the ending to a 90s decapitation simulator. On a less highbrow note, I always liked how her pants are actually semi-transparent, probably a simple effect to achieve even back then, but I didn't see it a lot and I thought it really helped sell her fantasy. Koyasha is a young master of ninjutsu, already having reached peak skill in hundreds of traceless killing techniques. But she doesn't kill for money or out of some solemn duty, she does it for love of the game. As such, when she finds out about her opposite number, Al-Rashid, Koyasha decides this would be a worthy test of her skills and makes him one of her next targets. The other is the mysterious influence behind the corrupt power that's only just now reaching Japan's shores, Asmodeus himself. 
She fights how you'd expect, dual-wielding Wakazashi and throwing shuriken, although there seems to be an electric aspect to some of her abilities. Maybe she trained at the same dojo as Kennen. Should she be unsuccessful in her campaign, Koyasha is scolded by her sensei for going off half-cocked trying to defeat the greatest evil the world has ever known all by herself. He busts her back down to sergeant so fast it makes her head spin, and she's forced to sweep the floors and do the laundry for the entire clan. Koyasha fails at defeating a literal demon, and as punishment, she gets grounded with extra chores. Hilarious. She even manages to eventually prove she's legitimately the greatest ninja in the world, but by the time she does, Asmodeus and the Covenant have already ruined everything, so what's the point? It turns out Koyasha prefers self-made rulers, whether they're benevolent or despotic. Should she find victory and claim the mace for herself, she just kind of ditches it and builds a monastery in the mountains of her home country in search of spiritual perfection. In her personal philosophy, the ebb and flow of power should be managed by what humanity can achieve on its own, not through a magical MacGuffin. To her, the mace is nothing more than a trophy, symbolizing her status as the greatest ninja of all time. A dude so cool he's known only by his job title, the Executioner is a torture artist who thrives off pain and misery. Exactly the kind of monster the Mace of Tannis would feel at home with. The Executioner's made his bones, plying his trade to the Covenant of Seven, keeping their prisoners and castoffs in his island fortress of El Catraz. I see what you did there. He's a hobbyist at heart, enjoying experimental new tortures and collecting noteworthy implements with which to cause harm. His axe, for example, was said to have been used to kill crusaders in Jerusalem. He even likes to have a little bit of fun with his prisoners and starts every day by releasing one onto his island. If they can find a way off, they're granted their freedom. If he catches them, he'll enact particularly brutal torture against them, such as flaying them alive. Most of the released prisoners opt to just become shark food, and no one has ever escaped. X sees the recent infighting amongst the Covenant as an opportunity to seize power, so he grabs his axe and his best throw in heads and leaves in search of Asmodeus. If I can criticize, however, Executioner suffers from the same big guy with an axe problem a lot of characters in fighting games have, in that he seems to use unwieldy swings and poke people with the butt of his weapon more than, you know, the choppy part. Even still, he's good at his job, and once Asmodeus is vanquished, the world enters a new age of torment, where every man, woman, and child is subjected to the senseless violence at the Executioner's depraved whims. If he instead fails, X goes back home, only to find Asmodeus there waiting for him. He admires the Executioner's collection, compliments his work, and then conjures up a Grand Inquisitor from the Crusades to give him a few pointers. The torturer becomes the tortured, as X is confined to his own hellish prison at the hands of cruel creativity for the rest of time. Ragnar Bloodaxe of the Torsgard Bloodaxes is a Viking prince whose family and village were mooned by Lord Demos. Wait, what? Man, I'm not exactly an expert on etymology or anything, but I don't think that means what you think it means. The idyllic winter paradise of Torsgard found itself beset by ominous black wolves with glowing red eyes that began attacking the smaller villages. Ragnar and his men followed a rumor that the wolves were coming from an eastern forest, but halfway into the journey had a premonition that it was all a ruse, that crimson-clad men were slaughtering his loved ones, so he turned back. Unfortunately, it was too late. Ragnar's family lay maimed amidst the snow, his legacy in ruin. From the tree line, the wolves watched, silently mocking him. The berserker gong descended upon Ragnar, and he vowed to find the man responsible and make him pay. The likeliest culprit? Crimson-clad Lord Demos himself. Ragnar uses twin axes, historically inaccurate helmet horns, and Shoryuken-like uppercuts to carve his way on a bloody path to Demos and Asmodeus after him. He uses the power of the mace to restore Torsgard and make it the most beautiful city in the north. He remarries, fathers many beautiful children, and peace and prosperity stand as a monument to his fallen family. Ever the warrior king, Ragnar remains vigilant in the event that evil once again rears its ugly head. If you're not so successful, Asmodeus curses Mr. Bloodaxe for his insolence, transforming him into a ravenous black wolf himself. Ragnar can only watch in horror, his sapient mind trapped in a body that knows only violence as it devours the very people he was trying to save. While some folks want peace, others only desire power. Countess Taria is the daughter of the Duke Malinoche of Iberia, one of the Covenant of Seven. Taria was born under a black moon and prophesied to be the downfall of Asmodeus, so understandably it was demanded of the Duke he hand over his offspring. But instead of Taria, he sacrificed her twin brother Taurus. More on him in a bit. I like this backstory because it screams hero origin, but the Countess is most definitely not a hero. Naturally inclined toward the dark arts, she has become an unrivaled sorceress and traversed many demonic realms in a bid for strength. The only thing that could offer her more is the Mace of Tannis, and so it shall be hers. Taria wields a broadsword and dagger supplemented by the aforementioned dark magic. More on that later. Even if she fails, Asmodeus is rather taken with her and makes her his bride. Not quite the power couple you might expect, the Countess resents not being the one in charge and comes up with new schemes and spells to attempt to wrest the mace from his grasp. Eventually, Asmodeus gets tired of this and banishes her to a barren plain where her soul withers for want of anything to conquer and kill. Very 90s villainess, evil for evil's sake and reveling in it until she's served with an ironic punishment. 
Helt Asmodeus with enough magic missiles, however, and the Countess takes hold of the mace, absorbing the generations of suffering it's caused and unleashing its power to become a demon herself. She leaves her father to rule Earth in her stead, foraying into all 99 layers of hell and fighting archdemon after archdemon to become queen of the netherworld. Our second to last of the main cast, Zhao Long is a blind, staff-wielding monk. The son of a Chinese warlord who was vassal to Batu Khan, Zhao Long's training began in his youth across the Mongolian steppes. In his mid-teens and climbing the ranks of the young soldiers, he was given the opportunity to publicly behead an enemy soldier in the glorious traditions of the Khan. However, while Zhao Long felt comfortable fighting, he didn't like the idea of killing in cold blood. His mercy was rewarded with exile, but not before the Khan burned out Zhao Long's eyes. Fortunately, Zhao Long was found by a group of Shaolin monks and they took him in, teaching him their ways as he slowly began to interpret the world around him through a spirit sense. But as Asmodeus rises to greater and greater power, the world cries out for aid. Zhao Long takes up his staff and journeys westward in a bid to destroy the Mace of Tannis. I like staff guys and Zhao Long is no different with big sweeping attacks and a decent fireball to keep enemies on their toes. However, Teenage Me was less than enamored with him since he was kind of placed as a gut check in the N64 arcade ladder where the game's difficulty jumped up and... I don't know, he doesn't have a flaming sword or nipple rings or anything, so I wasn't in love with the design. There's no arguing with results, however, and after vanquishing Asmodeus, he holds the mace in his hands and it calls to him. The mace promises to restore Zhao Long's sight, to provide him infinite wisdom and immortality that he may ponder every mystery of the world. But is it really a trap? Yes, it was. Already possessing great wisdom and appreciative of how the rest of his senses continue to perceive the world around him, Zhao Long destroys the mace and ends its influence over mankind. Even if Zhao Long were to lose, he simply returns home to meditate on his failures. Asmodeus can't have this and informs Zhao Long's father that his son yet lives. He relays this to the Khan, and outraged that the boy would insist on further insulting him by not having the good sense to just die, the Khan assembles an army and rides to the monastery. But the monks are ready. A climactic battle breaks out between the opposing forces, the outcome of which remains a mystery to this day. Zhao Long's good ending provides some interesting world building, with the mace talking to him and tempting him. We saw how Namira let her desire for revenge overtake her, but was that her attitude or an influence of dark powers? Are Mordos Kal and Ragnar truly benevolent rulers, stronger than the power of the mace of Tannis and able to wield it for good? Or is it just biding its time until the 2020s where it once again can feed upon widespread plague and suffering? Takeshi and Ichiro Tsunami are brothers. The former is the final member of the main roster, the younger brother who became a great warrior and noble samurai, while the latter is a time-release secret character in the arcades who can be accessed via a code on console. Both wield a katana, but Takeshi is faster while his older brother is more deliberate and throws his hat. As eldest son, Ichiro was the inheritor of the family's estate and fortunes. But as he watched his younger brother gain notoriety as the youngest general in the Emperor's army, his envy grew. Ichiro left Japan in search of Asmodeus, a man who was rumored to grant impossible power to those willing to pay the price. He returned with an army, sacking the territories of lesser feudal lords in a bid to bring the Mace's influence to Japan. Disheartened by the dark path his brother had taken, Takeshi vowed to restore him to his former self and sought out Asmodeus. Ichiro, of course, has designs on taking the Mace. Why borrow power when you can wield it wholesale? Win or lose, neither brother's endings are without tragedy. If Takeshi fails, he's forced to join Ichiro's army, but this doesn't last for long. Ichiro demands his brother conquer all of China, and rather than give him the satisfaction of seeing him fail, Takeshi commits ritual suicide on the steps of their family home, and in doing so becomes a romantic figure of Japanese legend. If Ichiro loses, he's betrayed by his closest men, who fear his manic abuse. They draw and quarter him, sending his parts to the four corners of the earth before enjoying a slightly less tyrannical rule of whoever replaces him. Even if he's successful, the mace brings him nothing but anguish. Takeshi escapes Ichiro's wrath and begins engaging in guerrilla warfare against his holdings. As Ichiro assumes the role of Emperor of Japan, he becomes so obsessed with finding his brother and destroying him that much of Japan is laid to waste in the process. Truly nothing can save Ichiro from his own madness. Even if Takeshi absconds with the mace to Lord Demos's lava castle, casting it into the molten moat like the fires of Mount Doom, the resulting explosion of power disintegrates the elder brother, his soul too corrupt to save. Takeshi becomes godlike, bathed in golden light as he is empowered by the innumerable souls freed from the mace. And though Japan enters a golden age under his guidance, Takeshi is racked with the shame of his greatest failure forevermore. Oh, crap! So dwarves are a thing in this game. I mean, there's demons and magic and stuff, to be fair, but for some reason, squat-bearded crafters living under the mountains is a few steps more toward the fantastic than I expected from the outset. Apparently, these people have been long enslaved by Lord Demos, forced to smith weapons and armor for his minions. This would no doubt include Demos' own flaming sword and the handsome flail that Mordos Cull received upon joining the mercenaries in his employ. But like any good autocrat, the working conditions set by Bavaria's answer to Sauron are cruel and oppressive. One such crafter, Gar Gudrunson, finds James Cameron-like inspiration in a nightmare full of fire and screams. Amidst the chaos, emerging victorious from a cloud of steam is a design of brass and wood that would finally free the dwarves from under Demos's boot. 
The dwarves set to work building it, with Gar the only man whose burning passion could drive him to pilot the war mech. This thing is as glorious as it is stupid. With a steel barrel for one hand and a spiked mace for the other, the war mech attacks from all angles, spinning and smashing as Gar shouts enthusiastically from its barrel cockpit. Failure is a dangerous game in such a contraption, of course. Gar manages to escape the wreckage of his craft with his life, but his adamant determination to see Demos and now Asmodeus defeated cause him to attempt more complicated and dangerous designs. Several dwarves lose their lives in the iteration process before Gudrunson himself finally perishes in a steam explosion. However, should he be successful, the war mech clutches the mace in its mace, and Gar is transfixed. He is treated to visions of upheaval, of dwarves living freely on the surface with humans subjugated under their rule. He returns to the halls of his mountain home and shows the mace of Tannis to the rest of the dwarves, spurring them to similar conclusions. More mechs are constructed, and eventually the dwarves burst forth from the earth, sowing discord and pain with their march towards supremacy. Hell Knight is an interesting character, though you'd be forgiven for thinking he isn't, what with his name being Hell Knight and not like Grix or something. It turns out even the denizens of Hell are tired of Asmodeus's shit, so Lucifer dispatches one of his soldiers to retrieve his Morning Star. Oh hey, I just got that. Good for you! Turns out using the mace is draining the dark energy that powers the Nether Realm, so off the Hell Knight goes, dual wielding axe like blades and shooting fireballs from his tail. Failure isn't really an option since Satan isn't notoriously understanding. With the alternative being divorced from his armor and left to slow roast in Hell's fires for all eternity, the pan drippings of his corpse feeding the hex slugs or whatever kind of creature dwells below the bowels of the inferno, the Hell Knight defeats Asmodeus and reclaims the mace. That's, that's seriously it, job done. The Mace of Tannis is safely back on the Devil's Mantle with only the mild lingering threat of extra-dimensional portals being opened up as a result of its use. But that's Earth's problem, not the Hell Knights. Another thing I like about the secret characters in this game is that a few of them have precedent in the story, like Ichiro and Sir Dragon. Especially with the arcade time released, it's almost like an early version of DLC. Originally a knight in the First Crusade, Dragon was killed by a soul-stealing axe, rendering him unable to find peace in the afterlife and pulling him from the grave as a revenant. Seeing the potential of a rotting crusader, Asmodeus offered him a position as one of the seven, and Dragon agreed, digging holes and stealing souls to create an army of undead both at his direct command and also left to roam free to terrorize unwary travelers. Of course, what is evil without unnecessary treachery? It turns out Asmodeus knew the location of Dragon's soul this whole time, so he's taking up his sword and shield to defeat his former master. If Warmech and another forthcoming character weren't in the game, I'd call Sir Dragon the comedy fighter. He vomits up green corpse gas, does a little Dr. Boskanovich can-can kick, and a spinning windmill attack, and his arm falls off during his victory pose. Despite this, he has some pretty good endings. Obviously, his soul is contained within the Executioner's Axe. Once it's destroyed and set free, he returns to his healthy, fabulous former glory. But with the sins he committed since his undeath, he is no longer welcome in the Kingdom of Heaven. So, Dragon puts himself to work on Earth, thwarting evil and righting wrongs wherever he can. Should he fall to Asmodeus, he is instead imprisoned and his soul forced back into his body, along with the soul of each of his victims. Dragon spends eternity trying to find himself from the jumbled mess of anguish and torment inside him. It's a lot like being in your 30s. Alright, two more secret characters, both of them connected to Taria, but each very different in tone. The first is Grendel, the last challenge you face at the gates of Machu Picchu before arriving at Asmodeus' chamber. Much like the Executioner, he doesn't make the best use of his hammer's reach, but he does a lot of great shoulder charges and headbutts with those horns, and he looks frickin' awesome. Definitely an imposing guardian and a great lead into the final boss. Grendel only has the vaguest, shadowy memories of a family, of being something more than he is now, but to discover the truth, he'd have to defeat Asmodeus and risk being turned into a malodorous dog-like gargoyle, without even the honor of being his master's greatest warrior. Still, some risks are worth the taking. If Grendel succeeds, his stony prison melts away to reveal Taurus de Castillo, Taria's brother and the heir apparent to the Iberian throne. As he grasps the mace of Tannis, suddenly the prophecy makes sense. Asmodeus had taken the right child, the one who would defeat his evil and bring hope to the people. Taurus slays his father, but cannot bring himself to kill Taria. Yet, she refuses to turn from the path of darkness, so he has her blinded and her tongue cut out so that she can no longer traffic with dark magics. Taurus becomes the most benevolent ruler the land has ever seen, leaving the evils of Asmodeus only a memory. And finally, to cap off this roster of heroes, monsters, and madmen, there's Pojo the Fighting Chicken. Literally, as I'm recording this, I realize that's a soft J. It's Pollo. Editing room Eric here, remembering that the announcer of the game calls her Pojo! It's a little debatable. He pronounces the J somewhere between the hard consonant and the soft Y sound, more like the Zhe in Zhao Long. But he also pronounces Ichiro as Ichiro, and I mean, come on. The joke's right there. Pollo, Spanish for chicken. Tari is a Spanish character. We're sticking with Pollo. 
Yes, I am being serious, this character exists. You can unlock Poyo with a little trick using Taria's fatality that turns her foe into a chicken, and then charge that chicken into battle. She fights like you would expect her to, with kicks, flaps, pecks, and an egg-launching projectile. She also has an amusing move where she surrounds herself with flames, because, you know, we cook and eat chicken. The cost of Poyo's failure is escape, going into hiding among normal chickens and living out her days on a farm. The beast earned Asmodeus's ire, however, and every time he sits down to chicken dinner, he hopes to recognize the bird he's about to devour as the once mighty Poyo. But we all know the true ending of Mace the Dark Age is in Poyo's victory. I don't know about you, but if I wrote a medieval sword fighting game, the canon climax would involve a particularly inspired chicken seizing all the power of the titular weapon. Taking it in her beak with a unique animation, Poyo grows giant-sized. Mega Ultra Chicken. The power of the mace has rooted itself in her chicken mind, you see. Whatever or whoever Poyo may have once been is gone, or perhaps never was there in the first place. All she wants is a good meal and a place to rest. But the mace has other plans. Now bearing the strength of 10,000 chickens, Poyo has developed a thirst for blood. She attacks villages by night, burning them with her flames and devouring the inhabitants, leaving nothing but ash. She is spoken of only in whispers, stories of a great winged beast descending from the heavens to lay waste to all in her path, emitting fire and swiping with terrible talons as people run in fear. They call it the Dragon. I guess there's also an alternate attire for Zhao Long you can unlock called Ned the Janitor, but he doesn't actually have any lore, so I don't think that counts. He's pretty cool, though. Janitors are cool. Or perhaps it's Janitors. There's also Spanky, come to think of it, the wooden trading dummy that you can use some cheats to sort of play. I'm honestly not even sure he'd bear mentioning it if it wasn't for his unique and utterly 90s look. We really did want to beat up smiley faces back then, huh? Mace takes the things I love from the other games we've covered this year and rolls it up into a ball. Interconnected stories, creative character designs, dark humor, people from different backgrounds all over the world, and it even holds up pretty well on a technical level. The attacks are way slower than modern games, but compared to other 3D fighters at the time, it wasn't bad. Not nearly as bad as everyone back then seemed to believe, anyhow. I'd be over the moon if we got a remake or a sequel to the game, but it's been a long time. Midway isn't a company anymore, and instead of video games, Atari is now into... Ugh. Cryptocurrency. I'm not even sure who holds the license, so I'm not holding my breath. But that doesn't mean I can't dream. Next time on Violent Profiles... Well, it's season two, isn't it? I reckon we'd better start with a bang. Hey, if you liked this video, could you hit the like button and tell me what you liked about it in the comment section? This not only feeds my fragile ego, but it also tells YouTube to promote the show, and the only way I get pancakes is if this show does well. Spam low kick on that subscribe button if you haven't already, and support us on Patreon at the $10 tier to get new episodes a month early. Shout out to all the names currently on screen for doing exactly that. Until next time, Whiteout.